somebody, the actual, actual story, there was one, some scholar or sage in the times of the Baal Shem Tov, who believed himself to be the most humble person who ever lived. You got that? <laughs> he thought of himself as the most humble person who ever lived. <laughs> now, how would he know? How can you know that you are the most humble person that ever lived? Well, it's very simple. He read in the Torah that Moshe, that Moses, Torah says, Moses was the most humble man who ever lived. Well, that's it. He doesn't have to go looking much further. Now he knows nobody is more humble than Moses. Except him. <laughs> because, now he had a very reasonable argument. Mo when Moshe became as great as he was, went up to Mount Sinai and spoke to God face to face and so on, his wife knew about it. His wife knew that he was that great. And this guy, this, this scholar, had kept his greatness even from his wife, which makes him more humble than Moshe. But the thinking was that humility means that great people don't tell anyone how great they are. Well, then he's greater than Moses because he didn't even tell his wife how great he was. Now we know. <laughs> right. Right. So, how did the story come out? <laughs> how does the whole world know that he thought that he was the most humble man in the world? On some occasion, when he realized how stupid he was, yeah, and he started growing up and, and realizing what humility really means, so on some occasion he said, you know what I used to think? You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> In other words, when he became a chassid, he confessed to this perverted thinking. But that, but that was a that was a uh, a common assumption that humility means that if you do great things, you don't tell anybody. If you're a great person, you don't mention it. That's humility. By the same token, a little bit off the subject. You're not allowed to talk Russian Hara. You're not allowed to speak badly of other people. It's one of the big sins. But as with everything else, you can take you can take it superficially or you can take it on a deeper level. What does it mean to not talk badly of others? To not speak badly of others? The superficial approach is you see other people's faults. You see how they're wrong and they're bad and they're not so smart and they're not so good and they're not so, so, so talented and they're not... And you don't say anything. You don't talk lush and hard. So you walk around smiling to everybody. You never have anything bad to say about anybody because you don't talk lush and hard. In fact, in some communities, they actually have a lush and hara hotline. It's an emergency number. It's an emergency number that when you feel that you might talk Lush and Hara, you dial this number and they talk you out of it. What's, what's wrong, what's missing, is that not talking Lush and Hara doesn't mean only to others. Don't speak badly of X to Y. Not talking Lush and Hara includes yourself. Don't tell yourself bad things about other people. 
But look, I mean, think of what's happening here. A person says, I am going to be very religious. I am going to be very pious. I will not say anything negative about my neighbor. You know, the dumb one. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say anything about them. Because as dumb as she is, I'm not allowed to say it. So to herself, she is talking lush and hard. She is telling herself how dumb her neighbor is. Only being a tzaddik, she won't tell me how dumb her neighbor is. Which is in a way quite selfish. <laughs> if you know some juicy gossip about someone, and you just refuse to share it with anybody, I mean, come on. So here you have a person walking around, very possibly a very critical, condemning, nasty, petty, jealous, vindictive person, walking around saying, oh, that one, hmm. And you never know. Right, you never know. So if you do the right things. The point is that not talking Lush and Hara doesn't mean you're nice. It just means you're not vocal. <laughs> That's the problem. The problem is that as nasty as you are, and as critical and as condemning and as vindictive and so on and so forth, if you don't say anything, you're going to walk around thinking you're wonderful. When in fact, you're full of poison. You hate everybody. You look down at everybody. You see everybody's faults. Sometimes you see faults that aren't even there. But you're excited because you don't say nothing. Rotten on the inside. That's worse. If you are that kind of a person, then admit it. Don't hide it. Not talking Lash and Hara properly means you have nothing negative to say. But not that you're walking around bursting with information, <laughs> but you bite your tongue and you don't say it. You know, it's like... Let me, let, me give you, let me give you an example. There's a mitzvah to love another Jew. Right? Now, what's the story with a person who does not love another Jew? Doesn't. But it is a mitzvah to love another Jew. So he walks around saying nice things, being friendly, being kind, being generous, hospitality. He's got an open house and an open heart and... He's doing the mitzvah. Is he doing the mitzvah? It's not that he's doing the mitzvah without kavanah. He's not doing the mitzvah. He doesn't love a fellow Jew. He's kind and he's charitable, but he doesn't love a fellow Jew. So what will come... Let me put it this way. There are certain mitzvahs which if treated as a mitzvah, stop being a mitzvah. As for example, giving tzedakah. Right? In giving tzedakah, it is one of the very few mitzvahs for which we don't make a bracha. Why don't we make a bracha? So there are all sorts of explanations because uh, you don't want to take time out before you give the, the, the hungry guy a sandwich. You're going to first take out time to make a bracha. The guy, the guy is hungry. And once you've done the mitzvah, then you can't make a bracha anymore. So or the other explanation is that since you don't know whether the poor man will accept your tzedakah, so you can't make a bracha because you don't know that you're going to do the mitzvah because he may not accept. So a mitzvah that is dependent on someone else, you can't make a bracha on it. All sorts of technical explanations. But the truest explanation is that in giving tzedakah, the mitzvah is that the poor man should get the tzedakah. It is not the mitzvah that you should give the tzedakah. And therefore, it's not your mitzvah. You can't make a bracha on it. If you're going to light Shabbos candles, that's your mitzvah. 
So you make a bracha because you're doing a mitzvah. But in giving the poor man food, of course, it, technically it is a mitzvah. But in essence, it's not, a, it's not your mitzvah. The man is hungry and has to have what to eat. So it's not a mitzvah. Yes. Yes. But the judgment is, what did you do to this person? Not what did you do for your own generosity, kindness, goodness, and... So if a person says, I'm not interested in this man's hunger. I don't care if he starves to death. But I'm religious, and there's a commandment. I keep all the commandments. I'll keep this commandment too. So I'm going to give tzedakah because it's a mitzvah. You're not doing the mitzvah right. But the mistake is that in certain mitzvahs, you're not supposed to treat it as a mitzvah. Because, because you're not the subject. You see what I'm saying? With most mitzvahs, you are the subject. It's your Shabbos candles. Right? It's your tefillin. It's your bracha. It's your davening. You are the subject. You're the object of the mitzvah. With other mitzvahs, you are not the subject at all. And the more you get yourself out of the way, the better the mitzvah is. Okay? So here, if you treat it as a mitzvah, you're destroying the whole thing. Like Mashiach. Is Mashiach coming? You ask someone, is Mashiach coming? And he says, well, I believe he is. I said, I didn't ask you what you believe. I'm asking you, is Mashiach coming? He says, well, I'm a religious Jew. I believe he is. So I didn't ask you if you were religious. I just want to know if Mashiach is coming. See, the person is treating Mashiach as if Mashiach was his mitzvah. And he is doing his mitzvah. He is believing in Mashiach. Is Mashiach coming? He really doesn't care. It's not an issue to him whether Mashiach comes or not. He is interested in doing mitzvahs. So if it's a mitzvah to believe in Mashiach, then he believes in Mashiach. So that means Mashiach is coming? He doesn't care what it means. It's his mitzvah, so he's doing the mitzvah. So if Mashiach doesn't come, it doesn't bother him at all. He did what he had to do. So the truth is that the subject of Mashiach is not your mitzvah. Mashiach is Mashiach. <laughs> he's, not, he's not a mitzvah of your imagination. Like a figment of your imagination. The same with loving a fellow Jew. Loving a fellow Jew doesn't mean you should be very pious and have and fulfill this mitzvah. We're not talking about you. We're talking about the other Jew. And the Torah says, the other Jew is lovable. You say, well, I don't know how lovable he is, but if you tell me to love him, I'll love him. Then you're not doing what it says. You're turning it into your personal mitzvah, when in fact it's a statement about somebody else. The statement about Mashiach is that Mr. Mashiach is coming. Whether you believe it or not. The statement about loving your fellow Jew is, every Jew is precious. Whether you think so or not. But then you turn it around and say, look, I don't know if every Jew is precious. But if I'm supposed to love him, then I will do the mitzvah because I'm perfect. And I do all mitzvahs. I don't know if Mashiach is coming. I don't know how he's coming, when he's coming, where he's coming. I don't know. But it says that I should believe, so I believe. Because I do what I'm told. Yeah, but you're not doing what you're told. You weren't told to do the mitzvah of Mashiach. You were told to expect his arrival. Same is true with Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara is very much like Tzedakah, very much like Ava Sisol. It has to do with somebody else, not with you. It is not a mitzvah for your benefit. It's a mitzvah for someone else's benefit. And if you say, well, I don't care about someone else, I just want to be sure that I'm doing all the mitzvahs I can do, then you're going in the wrong direction. So therefore, the statement not to talk Lash and Hara really comes from the Pasuk in Tehillim, 
Nitzor l'shen chamera. That's where it all comes from. What does Nitzor l'shen chamera mean? Prevent your tongue from evil. How do you prevent your tongue from evil? By biting it? No. Prevent your tongue from evil means don't give your tongue anything evil to say. Not have a lot of critical things to say, but don't say it. Nitzor l'shencha means almost keep evil from your tongue. How do you keep evil from your tongue? Before you can speak evil, you first have to think evil. So to prevent evil from coming to your tongue, you can't think evil. Because if you think evil, then you haven't prevented it from the tongue. Now it's available to speak. So even if you don't speak it, but it's available to speak. So you haven't fulfilled prevent evil from your tongue. Right. So, so what does it mean to not think evil? How can you stop yourself from thinking? You can't bite your brain the way you can bite your tongue. Not to think evil means have a generous opinion. Have a generous opinion. See the other person's virtues, not their faults. That's what it means. If you see the other person's virtues and you don't see their faults, then you have prevented evil from your tongue. Because you have, no, you have nothing evil to say. Therefore, if a person does have something evil to say, what should he do? Hmm? Of course, he should bite his tongue. Not because he wants to fulfill the mitzvah of not talking Lush and Har. He should bite his tongue because he's ashamed of himself for having thought, negative thoughts. Isn't that a different, completely different attitude? So it's not like, well, you know, my criticism of this person is valid, you know, she is an idiot. But I am not an idiot, so I do not talk Lashon Har. Which gives you a, a superiority com complex. The other attitude is, I'm walking around thinking that that person is an idiot. Doesn't that make me an idiot? So of course I'm going to bite my tongue. I don't want everybody to know that I'm an idiot. So now you're not walking around feeling better than, holier than. You're, feel, you're walking around feeling like a real jerk. Because you saw evil when you shouldn't have. So of course bite your tongue. But not bite your tongue in order to do the mitzvah. The mitzvah you blew already. That's why you should bite your tongue. Because you're in a bad way. You think negative, you're too critical, you condemn other people. And usually when we condemn other people for certain faults, we have those same faults. So condemning others is really a dumb thing to do because it only reveals my own, my own faults. So do you bite your tongue rather than say something negative? Of course. But not because you're doing the mitzvah of not talking Lashon Hara. You already talked Lashon Hara to yourself. It's bad enough. So now you're not going to say it again not because it's a mitzvah. You're not going to say it again because you're ashamed of what you thought. That's a very different, very different attitude. Now here you run into a real conflict because on the one hand, you're not allowed to talk Lashon Hara. On the other hand, you're not allowed to mislead the blind. So if somebody comes to you and says, you think I should take my car into this mechanic? And you say, oh yes, he's wonderful, he's a good man. You're misleading the blind. You're putting a stumbling block before the blind. It's called gnevas das. You must protect them from this bad mechanic. Only you can do it in a vulgar way, you can do it a nice way. So if somebody comes to you and says, I'm thinking of taking my car into the mechanic down the block, down the street, what do you think? You say, well, I like to take my car to the guy up the street. It could be, it could be. But if somebody's asking you for a mechanic, then you have to give them good advice. You have to guide them to the right to the right person. Also, Lashon Hara technically does not apply 
to that which is public knowledge. So if you say, for example, Ross Perot, the man doesn't know anything about politics. That's not Lushan Hara. No, if he was a Jew. Because it's public knowledge. You're not, you're not reviewing anything. You're not discussing anything that isn't known. Now, it may be that the one person you're sitting next to on the plane doesn't have never heard of Ross Perot. So you're telling him something he never knew before. But it's not Lashon Hara because everybody else knows. And the same thing with if a mechanic is very expensive. If he's very expensive, he's not keeping it a secret. That's what he charges. So everybody knows what he charges. It's not a secret. What if he's a bad mechanic? Won't we warn people about that? Yeah, but you can do it politely. You don't have to say the guy's uh, a low life. <laughs> You can just say, uh, the other guy's better. I, I like going to the other guy. And if they don't get the message, then you're going to have to come out and say, don't go to the guy, he'll rip you off. Right? Well, maybe it may not be public knowledge, but, but you have to protect the person who's asking you for advice. So you don't walk around saying, oh, you won't believe it, I went to this mechanic, he's such a low life." Hey, it's nobody's business right now. But if somebody comes to you and says, where should I take my car? So, to prevent someone from being hurt or damaged, even financially, you're allowed to say anything. It's not a choice. I mean, that's what the Torah says. The Torah says that you, can't, you may not permit someone to get hurt. Even if you have to be rough about it. I mean, it's not just Lush and Hara. If you see one person chasing another person, you have to stop the pursuer, even if you have to hit him over the head, and break his legs. So if you're allowed to break his legs, you're certainly allowed to say that he's a low life. <laughs> even if you don't like the person, you should still give him hospitality. Why? Because by doing the mitzvah, eventually you will get to be, where, you know, your mind will... But don't think I'm not doing the mitzvah and then not bother to change what's going on upstairs. Right. If you think, I don't like this person, but it's a mitzvah, so I'll do it. You're, th you're thinking wrong. Your heart will never get to the right place if you think like that. What you should be thinking is, I don't like this person, but I should. Not I should do the mitzvah. I should like this person. So maybe if I invite him into the house and I act nice to him, maybe I'll get to like him. But not, I got to do my mitzvah anyway. That just puts a wall between you and you'll never get to like him. Because you're becoming more and more of a tzaddik and he is remaining the same shulma as he always was. Well, you're drifting apart. You're not getting any closer. Like the person who says, I mean, there's a commandment in Torah, you're not allowed to take revenge. If somebody doesn't lend you the shovel when you need it, then you're not allowed to refuse to lend him a shovel when he needs it. That's taking revenge. But more than that, you're not allowed to take revenge and you're not allowed to hold a grudge. What does hold a grudge mean? Taking revenge means if you didn't lend me money when I needed it, I won't lend you money when you need it. So fine, don't lend me money. I don't care. Why don't I care? Because I will never lend you money again. That's not I don't care. That's revenge. <laughs> That's revenge. Then in addition to that, you're not allowed to take, carry a grudge. Carry a grudge means, oh, you didn't lend me money? Well, you're, you're a low life. But if you come and ask me, when you need to, to borrow some money, I will lend you the money because I'm not like you. That's carrying a grudge. So just like you're not allowed to refuse to do the favor, you're also not allowed to do the favor in spite. You see what I'm saying? It's like, I don't want to lend you money. I hate you. Because when I needed money, you wouldn't lend me any money. 
But when you come knocking on my door, as much as I hate you, I will, I will lend you money because I'm not a low life like you.